thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Mario Borden, who will be discussing molecular imaging study design. Dr. Borden has over 30 years of research experience in oncology, immunotherapeutics, molecular imaging, and assay development. He received his PhD in pathology from Duke University and served as the CEO slash CSO at the La Jolla Institute for Molecular Medicine prior to founding BioLoris, where he offers preclinical molecular imaging consultancy and CRO services. So without further delay, over to you, Mario. Hi. Well, thanks for the introduction, Melanie, and uh, thanks to all of you that are here today. And so we're going to take a uh, quick uh, overview of uh, preclinical uh, study design in the context of molecular imaging. So let's get right to the slide deck. So molecular imaging has, has been around for a while now. And uh, as Melania and I were talking a week or so ago, was recalling some of the uh, earlier history in, in regard to molecular imaging. And so this, I wanted to show in your right hand, upper right hand corner here, an example of an early preclinical oncology uh, study. And this is from 1984, and it was uh, part of a review uh, article, monoclonal antibodies as carriers of radiation and drugs for immunodetection and therapy of brain tumors. Sound pretty familiar? So this is an example of a, a nude mouse that was bearing a human glioma uh, at xenograft and uh, was injected with a radio labeled uh, monocle antibody to the tumor associated antigen. And so we see the distribution from 17 uh, hours post injection out to 65 hours. This was done with a clinical pinhole uh, gamma camera. This was the kind of gamma camera that's used for uh, thyroid uh, e examination. So there was no <laughs> uh, preclinical. The, uh, imaging devices at those times. And we can contrast that with, with what's going on today. And in the uh, image below that is uh, a overlay of an MRI of the rat brain. And a PET image is the red magenta uh, shadings are the uh, localization of a C11 labeled small molecule that's binding to receptors uh, within the brain. So we've come a long, long way. Let's move along now. We're going to talk about molecular imaging, some of the whys one would use molecular imaging uh, for a preclinical drug development uh, program. And we're going to have this uh, sort of drug development um, perspective as we move through, but none of this uh, excludes the uh, academic uh, basic research and its applications uh, during the uh, phase of uh, research. So we're going to get on to the four essentials of good study design. And we're going to wrap up with two examples of study designs. One, a bioluminescence uh, tumor efficacy study, xenograft model, and second, brain receptor occupancy or RO uh, study. So molecular imaging has been in the preclinical space for many decades, PET, MRI, CT, SPECT, ultrasound. And these are all in now the preclinical space, much more recent than the clinical. What's more is in the preclinical space, we have optical imaging, reporter genes with bioluminescence, and we have specific fluorescence probes, uh, particularly those uh, that are in the near infrared. Now, the progression is not simply from preclinical molecular imaging studies into the clinical area, but also back again. They're often in phase two trials, unanticipated or adverse events. And those need to be explored in 
the preclinical world, right? We can't do those kinds of investigations uh, in the clinical population. So it may be a mechanism of action, a safety issue, off-target PK, and uh, testing how we might mitigate uh, those events. So this is kind of a cycle from the preclinical to the clinical. It can often come back again to the preclinical and back to inform those clinical studies. And there are a number of reasons, advantages, if you will, for doing molecular imaging. But here I want to summarize some of the most important. And number one is the 40 digital in vivo data. This means that we can look at a multi-compartmental model of our world. We can look at it in three-dimensional space and we can look at it over time. We can now do in vivo drug candidate screening. It's 3R friendly. We're using far fewer animals in our studies because we can do these longitudinally. It's translational. We're moving from preclinical methods, data acquisition, image acquisition, that can be used directly in the clinical environment. It's FDA endorsed, it's IND accepted, and often becoming expected. So we're gonna cover two points in a little bit more detail. And, and one is this 4D environment. And the reality is we live in that 4D environment. Our drug pharmacology is in four dimensions. And so the capabilities of molecular imaging are to be able to get further definition as to the interactions between our drug and its target environment down to the receptor. Something we can't do simply with plasma samples, for example. Detection through methodologies that, that relate from this compartment, I'm not saying are not important. They are important. They have enormous amount of value, but I can't answer some important pharmacological questions. And that means getting to this point, getting to the receptor interactions and getting to these kinetics, K3 and K4. And we're going to examine in our last example with receptor occupancy a little bit more of the how we do that. Drug screening is now becoming an important means of trans in making that first translational step from the in vitro environment to the in vivo. I've been involved in assay development and research at an in vitro level uh, for many, many years. I understand it. I understand how valuable it can be. But I've also seen, and many of you no doubt have seen, that the translation from the in vitro to the in vivo is not always seamless. Indeed, it's often not seamless. And so now we have means by using reporter uh, genes and uh, like uh, various luciferase models mm -hmm. and to be able to use uh, probes that are specifically labeled with our molecule of interest. And we can now test very rapidly 10 animals at a time, be able to uh, acquire data within seconds or minutes at most and do a high volume turnover and screen three, four, five, 10 animals uh, and do multiple drug candidates in a very short period of time, confirm or illustrate issues from as a comparison with the in vitro data. So we can move along much more fast and we can address issues uh, to our further examination in the in vivo uh, preclinical space. So let's get on with the four essentials. Number one is the study outline. Two, selecting the imaging modality. Three, a very critical step, calculate sample size. And finally, putting the whole thing together, some considerations. 
Well, the first thing to do is put out, put together a study outline. This is something you do all the time. Pretty, pretty obvious. You have a number of tools for uh, doing that. But this is just a reminder. Uh, there's some key components. Number one, defining your groups, right? What are your control groups? Positive controls. What are the negative controls that may be necessary? What are the groups? Are we testing different concentration of, of a given drug candidate uh, and its effects, its uh, distribution, its kinetics, or are we comparing uh, different drugs? What are the groups that we're going to need to have? What are the procedures then that will be used on those animals? Most importantly, we need to examine our key measures. The key measures must be tied to what are the specific goals of this research project. Why are we doing the study? What answers do you want? Nowadays, with the wide range of methodologies, technologies, including molecular imaging uh, that are available to the researcher now, it becomes ever more the issue that the technology is not limiting our ability to answer questions. That is, these technologies, things like PET and CT imaging uh, can be used and added to answer those specific questions. So the technology does not define your how you answer the question. It needs to be the other way around. So really, really want to emphasize that. Key measures, what are the secondary measures? What are the other things that are important or want uh, to, uh, to add to this study? One caveat as always is don't try to do too much. It is far better to do a succession of well-designed focused studies than to try to do uh, two, three, four things at the same time and get no sufficient clarity on any one of those. Well, let's move on to how do you select your imaging modality? If you have experience with molecular imaging, uh, you've got that, that background already. You have some sense of which uh, modality you use for your question, an idea of what the advantages and disadvantages are. If you're new to this area, no problem. There are any number of people, your core imaging facility core or your uh, partner uh, company such as BioLaurus um, and uh, Spectral Imaging, I'm sure it'll be more than happy to help you go through these uh, kinds of issues. So we'd roughly divide molecular imaging capabilities in terms of anatomic and molecular. They actually kind of mix together these days a bit. So the anatomic are those things like MRI, CT, and ultrasound that give us an image of the tissue and the generalized stru structures of those tissues, soft tissues or more dense tissues, bone. So CT picks up bone extremely well, doesn't do so well in defining uh, the uh, soft tissue structures without contrast agents. You can add contrast agents and, and do that as well, okay? Molecular imaging, we're looking at molecules. This is the tracer world. This is where we have some sort of tag, a fluorescence tag, a, um, a, a radioactive tag, a positron emission for PET, or a gamma emitter for SPECT imaging. And so now we're looking at often in our studies, the combination where we wanna track a specific molecule. Let's say we're using PET to do that. We're gonna follow concentrations. We're gonna follow where it is, how long it's there, how much is there. But we're gonna put it into an anatomic reference. Where is it in the animal? Is it in the brain? What part of the brain? And for that, we need MRI and CT. So often these modalities are used in combination. Some are more appropriate for early stage uh, drug discovery, 
bioluminescence, fluorescence, uh, particularly good for biologics. And uh, with high put screening, one can do a preliminary biodistribution types of studies. Uh, when one gets to the point of meaning very quantitative data, uh, and uh, typically we're getting into the transition from that dis uh, drug discovery to drug development phase, and now it's quantitative biodistribution, uh, PKPD dosimetry, and uh, PET-CT, SPECT-CT are the dominant modalities in those phases. Essential three, calculating sample size and power. Well, the critical thing is sample power because it is well established in, in that, uh, you know, the specific power of, of uh, AD is going to be used. But this is a critical step and one we often kind of gloss over. It uh, could often be a very painful step because we understand in this process that to achieve the power to achieve the amount of data that we require to be able to distinguish between two events um, may mean using many, many more resources, many, many more animals than we had anticipated. Really, really important step. If we're going to understand and have a, a strong statistical basis for our conclusions from the results we receive, then we're gonna to have to go to our biostatistician and work through these. Now, there's many, many calculators on the uh, websites uh, on, readily available and plenty of review articles that'll help walk you through this process as, as well. This is an example of one sense, one sense, uh, excuse me, one such, uh, formula, and we're trying to define alpha and beta. Those are plug-in numbers. Uh, typically, we the decision on the effect difference, that's going to be very important. Uh, and you're going to have to do that empirically and, and see how close you can get to your reference distribution. But the, one of the keys, absolute keys, is to know the standard deviation, the variance that occurs within your assay. Very, very critical because that'll define and help allow you to use fewer and fewer animals, maybe three and maybe seven. It may re require more uh, to do that imaging study. So know that parameter. Now, when people come to Biolores and want to do a pet brain RO study, we know what the assay standard deviation characteristics are. You may know that for the assays that you work with. You may have to determine those empirically. You can also use data that's provided in the literature. If you're using an assay confident about the results and have that uh, parameters define the standard deviation in particular for that assay, then you're good to go as well. So very, very important. Essential four, putting it all together. And we've talked in this uh, context and in this model here, just as, just as a way to move through this process, uh, PET-CT. This has been defined as our primary measure but it's not the only thing that we can do. We can also acquire data from blood samples for looking at metabolites, uh, for looking at uh, other uh, drugs that may be involved or markers that are pertinent to the, to the model. We're gonna add groups for histology and tissue processing. These can all be integrated uh, in terms of can we put them in calendar them? Can we put them in a context for what we're gonna do? Let's say there's a, on day zero, here are the injections we have to provide for. Here's the imaging, how long is that imaging gonna take? How can we physically then integrate these other processes into them 
by planning for these ahead of time, and we use uh, typically a, an, an ESL for, for part of this. We use a, a, a laboratory notebook, uh, electronic form to, to help us with uh, some of this calendaring. You know, we've all been in the position where we try to do two things at the same time in the same space. And you know what, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So a little planning up ahead. Uh, makes a, makes a huge difference. So let's move through a couple of examples. And first up, uh, a uh, <clears throat> CDX model, and this is going to be an oncology efficacy model. We're going to use in this example a tumor cell line of interest, and it now uh, is expressing inserted into it is the gene for N look, and this is a, a version of luciferase. So now all our tumor cells that are gonna be used for our xenograft model are all capable of glowing. Whenever we want to see that cell light up, we will put it in the presence of luciferin, this is the luciferase uh, substrate. So what we're looking at here is the actual cellular tumor load within the cell, not the tissue, not the, the fibrous responses, not the vasculature, but the tumors itself. So that we have a more direct measure of efficacy. We set up the model as usual. We're gonna do the treatments uh, as usual. We're presuming this is a 28 day study, it has six time points. But there's some now some fundamental differences between this study design and a conventional or typical uh, model study. So in a typical study like this, you're going to need 10 to 20 animals per group, mice per group in this case. And you're going to have uh, a day zero, and you're going to have like at least six time points, maybe weekly imaging in this study. So you're going to use in a conventional study, about 120 to 240 animals. By using the smaller groups and using a longitudinal study, let's say those groups are still 10 to 20. Uh, now you're using 20 to 40 uh, animals in the study. So there's a huge difference in the number of animals being used. The throughput is high uh, because we're able to image uh, large numbers 50 uh, animals in a day. Um, we've, we've, we've pushed it a little further, uh, but very conveniently we can, we can uh, accommodate 50 to 75 animals in a day. So we're able to look at that study and move it along. We can also do a terminal group for tissue acquisition for, for example, histopathology. With our data now, we've got a 40 longitudinal data set. We've used far fewer animals than is typical. And all of this data is uh, usable in your uh, IND. So let's look a little bit about uh, some of the integrations one has uh, available to you in this study by again, focusing on BLI. And that is your key measure. You're measuring the tumor load. You have a valid means of looking at measuring efficacy over 28 days. What's the role then of uh, immunohistology, for example? The standard histopathology. And that's to uh, add depth to the data. You've answered the question, is there a valid response to this drug? Hopefully, it's lowering the number of tumor cells in the xenograft over time. Now, the histology focus on exactly what it is good for, which is looking at the cellular level and the tumor cells themselves, their status, are they necrotic, are they dividing? And you're looking at the tumor environment, the context of that tumor 
including the vasculature, uh, looking at fibrosis, the introduction of uh, macrophages, uh, T cells uh, into the environment, specific markers that may be pertinent uh, to looking at changes in the environment. And those now can be done as a subset of groups. You don't need six uh, groups for immunology or histology. Maybe it is two groups, a day zero and a day 14. You can always use that imaging group for your day 28 uh, hist histologic uh, sampling. Add blood sampling. You're, you're not constrained from combining these different platform technologies to gain as much depth as you can in your study. Now let's move uh, to PET-CT CNS receptor occupancy or RO studies. Now these are considered by, to my, by many as the most uh, sophisticated, uh, difficult, challenging, and uh, uh, you know, high-end uh, technical uh, kind of uh, study. They require a, lo a lot of experience, um, yes, but but they're easily understandable, uh, and even if you're uh, not familiar with the with a methodology in, in detail. Uh, it, this is no different than doing a, an RO study by any other methodology at its, at its core. So we're going to go through some of those steps and how we acquire data for receptor occupancy. And so again, at its core, we're trying to compare the binding of a receptor to a reference of our comparator drugs, our test drugs, to an identifiable specific ligand for the receptor of interest. That ligand should be binding to the receptor with very high specificity. It should be binding with sufficient affinity that the profile on and off of the receptor is sufficient to be detectable. Uh, and uh, that uh, we can label it in a way that is not going to alter the characteristics, the biological function of that molecule, its binding characteristics, and its travel into the site of uh, the receptor. Remember, in this study, we're talking about a CNS uh, brain receptor study, and so the blood-brain barrier is an important consideration in all of this. In our model here, we're looking at the introduction of the radio-labeled drug in a challenge format in which we present the challenge, the unlabeled comparator to drug or control before that of the radial ligand. So one could inject them at the same time. We tend to prefer uh, to do it in, uh, in advance. The, typically it's 10 to 15 minutes in the advance of the challenge. And this, allows our comparative drug to cross the blood-brain barrier, interact with and bind to the receptor of interest and uh, come to a partial equilibrium, but then we can uh, inject the radio tracer. The radio tracer then is going to see and bind to those unbound available receptors. And so we should see a change in the receptors bound as a result of the pre-challenge with the uh, comparative drug. We typically do these images for 60 to 90 minutes to acquire sufficient data, particularly on the dissociation side of this process. So we've injected uh, radial ligand, it increases rapidly, it increases in the tissue itself, and having reached uh, a maximum, then the, there's a dissociation. So we have more removal, less population of molecules to bind our receptor over time, right? Basics. We would have acquired some 825 images in such a study. We've measured from seconds to increasing minutes uh, intervals over this 90 
minute period. We have that data in three dimensions. And now we can start to analyze that data. And typically what we'll do is we'll take, uh, we're, we're using OAuth and uh, PMOD modules uh, to do this process. And so to order to find the physical areas in the brain, the anatomic areas, and overlay them with the data that we've acquired by the PET, we'll do uh, a merging with the brain atlas in this example for the rat brain. That atlas then defines volumes of interest that are defined for each of these brain segments. And then therefore the amount of radioactivity in each of those regions can be determined and it can be determined over time. So we may have 34 to 50 some volumes of interest within the brain. And we have these time activity curves. If we have different concentrations of our comparator competing for the receptor sites of the radio labeled ligand, we should see uh, something like a, a linear change in the receptor occupancy. We can plot that as percent receptor occupancy versus a molar concentration for kilogram body weight or uh, let's say uh, a weight milligram of drug per uh, kilogram body weight. Compare each of the concentrations for a specified reference receptor occupancy value and it it could be one of, of a, a number of uh, values, typically 50%, 30% can often be used depending on the individual experimental situation. So this gives you an overview of uh, this kinds of study. We're typically using as, as few as five, three animals as comparators. Typically it's more like five um, mice or rats uh, for each of our control groups and uh, comparator groups in this type of uh, study. So let me summarize. Planning is, is critical. Get those key measures defined. Uh, see how the imaging modality is going to fit with providing the answer you need for your experiment and use that modality. Be able to integrate a variety of different acquisition data, uh, you know, from histopathology to looking at uh, the distribution of blood of your drug of interest or other biologically significant marker. And most important, uh, I put it last, but we presented it as essential three, and that's to be able to do that analysis and, and, and getting a, that visit with a biostatistician and determine um, what the real end needs to be uh, for your group. So that uh, concludes my uh, presentation and thank you very much for your time.